Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt and welcome to Genetics. In this session, we're going to continue our discussion about Mendelian traits and Mendelian inheritance, but we're going to apply it to human beings. Obviously, Mendel was using pea plants, and it is an interesting thing to take note that, yes, Mendel did use pea plants. Uh, however, it was not 100% clear at the time whether his work would necessarily be applicable to humans, for one thing, or even, you know, other organisms of different types. I mean, he showed it was true in peas, but a lot of other experiments did eventually show, and we'll get to, to this lots later, that pretty much the way it happens in his peas is the way it happens in all organisms. Now, of course, there are um, a lot of interesting sort of exceptions, and, you know, it, it gets very complicated, which is why we have to have the class. But what we want to focus on here is human genetics, and it turns out that um, many human traits, certainly not all, but many significant traits, both disease-causing and otherwise, do get inherited in humans in a relatively simple Mendelian fashion. Perhaps obviously, as I say here, you can't really experiment so freely with human beings. We can't say, all right, we're going to check this out. You mate with that one, and then we'll wait till you have offspring, and we'll count them up. Aside from the obvious ethical uh, considerations, it just wouldn't be practical because of the long generation time of human beings, right? Even if people uh, volunteered for the study, it would take forever. But we do have a way around that, as it were. And we can use what's called a pedigree analysis. Really all a pedigree analysis is, is a detailed family history. So we're looking back in time at someone's parents, grandparents, cousins, uh, all sorts of things. And from that, it's almost as if just through what occurred, you know, during what people did, the experiments have already been done for us in a way. We're looking at a bunch of... It is historical data. We're looking back in time, but you can almost pretend like, okay, what about these two original people? And they had these kids, and they had those kids, and based on these diagrams and this evidence, we can try to deduce how, in fact, a human trait is inherited. So this pedigree analysis can often tell us one of the major things that we're interested in is whether a human allele is inherited in a dominant fashion or in a recessive fashion. Okay, so that's what we're going to devote this uh, analysis to. And I'm not going to, certainly I would never say that any of this is easy. I think that, well, you'll see when we get to some of the more complicated looking pedigrees, just don't panic. Sometimes it's not as bad as you might think. So let's start with some basic ideas just about pedigree analysis and the way things are written. So this is a obviously fairly simple diagram. And what it's showing is two human individuals who either got married or didn't, but one way or another, they had a child together, all right? So here are some conventions. A circle always refers to a female in these type of diagrams, and a square always refers to a male. Totally arbitrary, somebody just made that up, but that's the way it's always done. And you might notice that some of these individuals are not shaded, and this one here is shaded. Shading implies, see, this is often done for disease uh, traits because we want to find out, for example, someone has cystic fibrosis, it's clearly a genetic disease because it runs in families. So if we want to start getting to the bottom of it, one of the fundamental things we need to know is whether it's inherited in a dominant or a recessive fashion. So in this case, what I'm going to say is shading means affected by the disease. So in this case, it doesn't have to be cystic fibrosis. It could be anything. But what we're saying here is that the two parents were not affected by the disease, and the child, who happens to be a girl in this case, was affected by the disease. And remember, this is what happened. So if you were a genetic counselor or something, a couple would come to you and say, look, 
we don't know what's going on. We're perfectly healthy, but our daughter has this genetic disease. What do you think about that? And that's obviously more in a, you know, a counseling setting. But from a perspective of just understanding the genetics, perhaps the first time this ever happened, and someone said, you know, whatever this disease is, we're going to look into how it's inherited. What information can we gather from even this simple diagram? And then we'll take that and apply it to some more complicated actual life histories. Okay? So I'm sorry to be redundant, but let's just state what it is. Remember, we always want to know what we're looking at. So we're looking at a female and a male that got together. When you have a line like this going between two people and then a drop down from them, that always means that they had a, a child. If they had more than one child, you would see this expanded out and you, you could put as many individuals there as you want. But let's just keep it simple at the beginning. So we have two choices here, right? Either this is inherited in a dominant fashion or it's inherited in a recessive fashion. Seems simple enough, but how the heck can we figure it out? Well, what you have to do in all of these situations, guys, it's a little different than the way you're used to doing it so far, whether it's problem solving or even thinking about it. You're used to saying, I'm going to cross this with this and make predictions about the offspring. Sometimes they'll give you the data and you have to go back and deduce sort of what happened. This is more like that, right? You didn't initiate the cross, but it may as well be that way. Two people were crossed. We wouldn't say that with humans, but that's what happened. And the offspring came about. And unfortunately, they happened to have, let's just say it's a disease. It could be a regular trait like eye color or something. So what you have to do, guys, is almost become a detective. It really is like doing detective work because you have to explore each possible situation and see if the data corresponds with one or the other. So let's just say we'll make a hypothesis, right? Meaning it doesn't necessarily need to be true, but this is a possibility. Let's explore if this were dominant first, right? So based on what you know about dominance, this affected individual here would have to, if dominant, right, think of what she would have to be. And let's arbitrarily use the letter A just because it's first. What we know about this uh, girl is that she would have to be carrying at least one big A. I, I just want to make this 100% clear. We're going under an assumption, a hypothesis, that this allele is inherited in a dominant fashion. So then we're saying, all right, if that's true, then it must be true that she has one big A, right? We don't even know what she has, as you see here at the other position, because we can't tell that. That's the whole idea of dominance, right? What it means, though, is that she would have to get that big A from one of her parents, correct? It has to be so. But could she get it from either of these parents? The answer is no, And but make sure you understand why. If either of these parents had the big A, even one of them, wouldn't they likewise be affected by the disease as is she? The answer is yes, because you only need one copy of a dominant allele, as you know, for the trait to express itself. So when you see a situation like this, where a child is dominant, sorry, a child is affected and neither of the parents are, dominance is pretty much ruled out. So I'm not saying, you know, eventually when you get used to doing these, you'll look at that and you'll see right away that this can't be dominant. But let's follow through in the correct way. So if it was dominant, this would have to be true. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, is that possible given the data that we have? And it turns out it's not possible. So you then have to say, well, you know, it might be tempting to just say, oh, well, then it must be recessive. But you have to go through with the analysis and say, basically, all right, well, we think it's recessive, but let's see. Get rid of a lot of this mess. If it's recessive, what would we know? Again, starting over, new hypothesis. This is inherited in a recessive way. So...